Thank you for joining me today. I'm Samir Pradhan from the Linguistic Data Consortium at the University of Pennsylvania and founder of semantics.org. Today we'll be addressing research in computational linguistics, also known as natural language processing, a sub area of artificial intelligence with a focus on modeling and predicting complex linguistic structures from various signals. The work we present is limited to text and speech, but it can be extended to other signals. We propose an architecture, and we call it GRAIL, which allows the representation and aggregation of such rich structures in a systematic fashion. <laughs> I'll demonstrate a proof of concept for representing and manipulating data and annotations for the specific purpose of building machine learning models that simulate understanding. These technologies have the potential for impact in almost every conceivable field that generates and uses data. We process human language when our brains receive and assimilate various signals, which are then manipulated and interpreted within a syntactic structure. It's a complex process that I have simplified here for the purpose of comparison to machine learning. Recent machine learning models tend to require a large amount of raw, naturally occurring data, and a varying amount of manually enriched data, commonly known as annotations. Owing to the complex and numerous nature of linguistic phenomena, we have most often used a divide and conquer approach. The strength of this approach is that it allows us to focus on a single or perhaps a few related linguistic phenomena. The weaknesses are the universe of these phenomena keep expanding as language itself evolves and changes over time. And second, this approach requires an additional task of aggregating the interpretations, creating more opportunities for computer error. Our challenge then is to find the sweet spot that allows us to encode complex information without the use of manual annotation or without the additional task of aggregation by computers. So what do I mean by annotation? In this talk, the word annotation refers to the manual assignment of certain attributes to portions of a signal which is necessary to perform the end task. For example, in order for the algorithm to accurately interpret a pronoun, it needs to know that pronoun, what that pronoun refers back to. We may find this task trivial. However, current algorithms repeatedly fail in this task. So the complexities of understanding in computational linguistics require annotation. The word annotation itself is a useful example because it also reminds us that words have multiple meanings, as annotation itself does. Just as I needed to define it in this context so that my message won't be misinterpreted, so too must annotators do this for algorithms through manual intervention. Learning from raw data, commonly known as unsupervised learning, poses limitations for machine learning. As I described, modeling complex phenomena need manual annotations. The learning algorithm uses these annotations as examples to build statistical models. This is called supervised learning. Without going into too much detail, I'll simply note that the recent popularity of the concept of deep learning is an evolutionary step where we have learned to train models using trillions of parameters in ways that they can learn richer hierarchical structures from very large amounts of annotated, unannotated data. These models can then be fine-tuned using varying amounts of annotated examples, depending on the complexity of the task, to generate better predictions. As you might imagine, manually annotating complex linguistic phenomena can be very specific labor intensive task. For example, imagine if we were to go back through this presentation and connect all the pronouns with the nouns to which they refer, even for a short 
18 minute presentation, this would require hundreds of annotations. The models we build are only as good as the quality of the annotations we make. We need guidelines that ensure that the annotations are done by at least two humans who have substantial agreement with each other in their interpretations. We know that if we try to train a model using annotations that are very subjective or have more noise, we will receive poor predictions. Additionally, there is the concern of introducing various unexpected biases into one's models. So annotation is really both an art and a science. In our remaining time, we will turn to two fundamental questions. First, how can we develop a unified representation of data and annotations that encompasses arbitrary levels of linguistic information? There is a long history of attempting to answer this first question. This history is documented in our recent article, uh, and you can refer to that article. It would be on the uh, website. It is as if we have, a, as a community, have been searching for our own holy grail. The second question we will pose on is, what role might Emacs, along with org mode, play in this process? While the solution itself may not be tied to Emacs, Emacs has built-in capabilities that could be useful for evaluating potential solutions. It's also one of the most extensively documented piece of software and the most customizable piece of software that I have ever come across. And many would agree that um, uh, with that. In order to approach this second question, we turn to the complex structure of language itself. At first glance, language appears to us as a series of words, words, form sentences, sentences form paragraphs, and paragraphs form completed text. If this was a sufficient description of the complexity of language, all of us would be able to speak and read at least 10 different languages. We know it is much more complex than this. There is a rich underlying recursive tree structure. In fact, many possible tree structures, which makes a particular sequence meaningful and many others meaningless. One of the better understood tree structures is the syntactic structure. While natural language has rich ambiguities and complexities, programming languages are designed to be parsed and interpreted deterministically. Emacs has been used for programming very effectively. So there is a potential for using Emacs as a tool for annotation. This would significantly improve our current set of tools. It is important to note that most of the annotation tools that have been developed over the past few decades have relied on graphical interfaces, even those used for enriching textual information. Most of the tools in current use are designed for an end user to add very specific, very restricted information we have not really made use of the potential that an editor or a rich editing environment like Emacs can add to the mix. Emacs has long enabled the editing and manipulation of complex embedded tree structures abundant in source code. So it's not difficult to imagine that it would have many capabilities that we, we need to represent natural language. In fact, it already does that with features that allow us to quickly navigate through sentences and paragraphs and with a, with a few keystrokes or to add various text properties, to text spans, uh, to create overlays, to name but a few. Emacs has figured out way, uh, this way to handle Unicode. So you don't even have to worry about the complexity of uh, managing multiple languages. It's built into Emacs. In fact, this is not the first time Emacs has been used for linguistic analysis. <laughs> One of the breakthrough moments in language, natural language processing was the creation of a manually created syntactic trees for a million word collection of Wall Street Journal articles. This was around 1992, before Java or graphical interfaces were common. 
the tool that was used to create that corpus was Emacs. And uh, it was created at Penn and is uh, famously known as the Penn Tree Bank. And 92 was about when the Linguistic Data Consortium was also uh, established. And it's been about 30 years that it has been uh, creating various language related resources. Uh, <clears throat> org mode, in particular, the outlining mode, or rather the enhanced form of outlining mode, allows us to create rich outlines, attaching properties to nodes, and provides commands for easily customizing sorting of various pieces of information as per one's requirement. This can also be a very useful tool. <clears throat> this enhanced form of outline mode adds more power to Emacs. It provides commands for easily customizing and filtering information while at the same time hiding unnecessary context. It also allows structural editing. This can be a very useful tool to enrich corpora where we are focusing on limited amount of phenomena. The two together allow us to create a rich representation that can simultaneously capture multiple possible sequences, capture details necessary to recreate the original source, allows the creation of hierarchical representation, provides structural editing capabilities, that can take advantage of the concept of inheritance within the tree structure. Together, they allow local manipulations of structures, thereby minimizing data coupling. The concept of tags in org mode complement the hierarchy part. Hierarchies can be very rigid, but through tags on hierarchies, we can have a multifaceted representations. As a matter of fact, org mode has an ability for the tags to have their own hierarchical structure, which further enhances the representational power. All of this can be done as a sequence of mostly functional data transformations. Because most of the capabilities can be configured and customized, it is not necessary to do everything at once. Instead, it allows us to incrementally increase the complexity of the representation. Finally, all of this can be done in plain text representation, which comes with its own advantages. Now let's take an exa a simple example. This is a uh, short video that I'll play. Here we have a sent uh, example sentence. I saw the moon with a telescope. Sorry. Oh. Sorry about that. <clears throat> the sentence is the, I saw the moon with a telescope. And let's just make a copy of the sentence. And what we can do now is to see what does this sentence comprise? It, it has a uh, noun phrase I followed by a verb saw. Then the moon is another uh, noun phrase and the with a telescope is a prepositional phrase. Now, one of one thing that you might uh, remember from grammar school or syntax is that there is a syntactic structure, and if you in this particular case, because we know that the moon is not typically. Uh, something that can hold the telescope, that the seeing must be done by uh, me or I, and uh, the telescope must be in my hand, or I, I'm viewing the moon with a telescope. However, it is possible that in a different context, the moon could be referring to an animated character in a uh, animated series and could actually hold a telescope. And in that case, the situation might be that I'm actually seeing uh, the moon holding a telescope. I mean, the moon is holding the telescope and I'm just seeing the moon holding the telescope. 
And this is one of the uh, most, the oldest and the, one of the most uh, complex um, linguistic uh, ambiguity or linguistic um, uh, phenomena that requires world knowledge. And it's called the PP attachment problem, where the prepositional phrase attachment um, can be ambiguous and uh, various different contextual cues have to be used to resolve the ambiguity. So in this case, as you saw, both the readings are technically true depending on different contexts. So one thing we could do is just uh, cut the tree and duplicate it, and then let's create another node and call it an art node. And because we are saying this is one of the two interpretations. Now let's call one interpretation A, and uh, that interpretation essentially uh, is this uh, child of that node A, and that says that the moon uh, is holding the telescope. Now we can create another representation B, where we uh, capture the other uh, interpretation where uh, this the, the, the moon, or, or I am actually holding the telescope, and uh, watching the moon using it. So now we have two separate interpretations in the same structure. And all we, we were able to do is with this with very quick uh, a few keystrokes. Now, while we are at it, let's add another uh, interesting thing. This node that represents I can technically be a lot of different things. Like it can be uh, he, It can be he, it can be she, it can be uh, the children, uh, or it can be uh, you know the people. Basically, any entity that has the uh, capability to see would uh, can be substituted in this particular node, and. <clears throat> Let's see what we have here. Now we just uh, are getting sort of a zoomed view. Now let's go to the next thing. So in a sense, in a sense, we can use this power of functional data structures to represent various potentially conflicting and structural uh, readings of a flat piece of text. In addition to that, we can also create more texts, each with different structure and have them all in the same place. This allows us to address the interpretation of static sentence that might be occurring in the world while simultaneously in inserting information that would add more value to it. This makes the enrichment process also very efficient. Additionally, this we can envision that a power user of the future or present, who uh, can not only annotate spans, but also edit them in C information in situ in a way that could help machine algorithms generalize better by making more efficient use of the annotations. So together, Emacs and org mode can speed up the enrichment of the signals in a way that allows us to focus on certain aspects and ignore others. Extremely complex landscape of rich structures can be captured consistently in a fashion that allows computers to understand language. We can then build tools to enhance the tasks that we do in our everyday life. YAMR is the acronym or the uh, file type or specification that we are creating to capture this uh, new represent, rich representation. We'll now look at an example of spontaneous speech that occurs in spoken conversations. Conversations frequently contain errors in speech, interruptions, disfluencies, 
verbal sounds such as cough or laugh and other noises. In this sense, spontaneous speech is similar to a functional data stream. We cannot take back words that come out of our mouths, but we tend to make mistakes and we correct ourselves as soon as we realize that we have made, we have misspoken. This process manifests through a combination of a handful of mechanisms, including immediate correction after an error. Uh, and we do this unconsciously. Computers, on the other hand, must be taught to understand these. Uh, there is a example uh, document or outline or part of a document that is uh, that illustrates various different um, aspects of the representation. We don't have a lot of time to go through many of the details. I would highly encourage you to um, play a, um, uh, I, I'm planning on making some um, videos or ASCII uh, cinemas that uh, I'll be posting and you can, uh, if you're interested, you can uh, go through those. Uh, the idea here is to try to give a slightly more complex uh, use case, uh, but again, given the time constraint and, and the uh, amount of uh, information that needs to fit in the screen, we uh, this may not be very informative, but at least it will give you some idea of what can be possible. And in this particular case, what you're seeing is that there is a sentence which is what I am, I am to telling now. Essentially, there is a repetition of the word I am, and then there is, there is a partial word that somebody tried to say telling, but started saying true, and then re uh, corrected themselves and said telling now. In the, so in this case, you see, uh, we can capture two uh, words uh, or a sequence of words, also a sequence of uh, tokens, uh, one thing to uh, an interesting thing to note is that in Engl uh, in uh, NLP sometimes uh, we have to break typically uh, words that don't have spaces into two separate words, especially con contractions like I am, which is which is actually I am. So the syntactic parser needs needs two separate uh, nodes. But anyway, so all uh, you can see that here. The other uh, this view, what this view shows is that with each of the nodes uh, in the sentence or in the representation, you can have a lot of different properties that you can attach to them. And these properties are typically hidden, like you saw in the earlier uh, slide, but you can use make use of all these properties to do various kinds of uh, searches and uh, filtering. And on the right-hand side here, this is actually not a legitimate, um, syntax, but on the right are descriptions of what each of these um, represent. This information is also uh, available in the article um, and you can see there, but it shows how rich you can, uh, how, how much uh, rich context you can capture. This is just a more closer snapshot of the properties uh, on the node. And you can see we can have things like whether the word is a token or not, whether it's incomplete, whether some words might want to be filtered out for parsing. And we can say this parse ignore, or some words are re restart markers. We can mark uh, add a restart marker, or sometimes uh, some of these might have durations, things like that. The other fascinating thing uh, of the uh, this representation is that you can edit properties in the column view. And suddenly you have this tabular data structure and combined with the hierarchical data structure. And as you can, you may not be able to, uh, you're not able to see it here, but what has also happened here is that some of the tags have been inherited from the, uh, from the uh, earlier nodes. And so you get a much fuller picture of things. And essentially, you can filter out things that you want to process, process them, and then reintegrate it into the whole. So in conclusion today, we have proposed and demonstrated the use of an architecture grail, which allows the representation, manipulation, 
and aggregation of rich linguistic structures in a systematic fashion. We have shown, Gra shown how GRAIL advances the tools available for building machine learning models that simulate understanding. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. My contact information is on this slide. If you are interested in additional example that demonstrates the representation of speech and written text together, please continue watching. Otherwise, you can stop here and enjoy the rest of the conference. Welcome to the bonus material. I'm glad for those of you who stuck around. We are now going to examine an instance of speech and text signals together that produce multiple layers. When we, have, when we take a spoken conversation and use the best language processing models available, we suddenly hit a hard spot because the tools are typically not trained to filter out the unnecessary corrupt in order to automatically interpret the part of what is being said and that is actually relevant. Over time, language researchers have created many interdependent layers of annotations, yet the assumptions underlying them are seldom the same. Piecing together such related but disjointed annotations and their predictions poses a huge challenge. This is another place where we can leverage the data model underlying the Emacs editor, along with the structural editing capabilities of the arg mode to improve current tools. Let's take this very simple looking utterance, mm, lip smack, and that's it. <laughs> Looks like the person, so this is, a, what you are seeing here is a transcript of, a, uh, of an audio signal that has a lip smack and a laugh as part of it. And there is also a uh, um, like interjection. So this has a few interesting um, noises uh, and specific things that would be uh, illustrative of what we are going to, how we are going to um, represent it. Okay. So let's say you want to make, have a syntactic analysis of this sentence or utterance. One common technique people use is just to remove the craft and you know write some rules, clean up the utterance, make it look like it's proper English, and then uh, you know tokenize it and basically just use standard tools to process it. But in that process, they end up eliminating valid pieces of signal that have meaning to others studying different phenomena of language. Let's just see what's happened here. You have the rich transcript, the input to the syntactic parser, as you can see, there is a little tokenization happening where you we inserted space between that and the uh, contracted is and between the period and the it. And the output of the syntactic parser is shown below, which surprise is a S expression. Like I said, the parse trees uh, when they were created and they are still uh, largely when they are used are as expressions and most of the viewers here. Let's say you want to integrate phonetic information or a phonetic layer that's in the audio signal and do some analysis. Now, it would need you to do a few, take, you, take a few steps. First, you would need to align the transcript with the audio. This process is called forced alignment, where you already know what the transcript is and you have the audio and you can get a good uh, alignment using both that in pieces of information. And this is typically a technique that is used to create training data for uh, training automatic speech recognizers. One interesting thing is that in order to do this forced alignment, you have to keep the non-speech events in transcript because they 
consume some audio signal. And if you don't have that signal, the alignment process doesn't know exact, you know, it doesn't do a good job because it, it needs to align all parts of the signal with something, either pause or silence or noise or words. Interestingly, punctuations really don't factor in because we don't speak in punctuations. So one of the things that you need to do is remove most of the punctuations, although you'll see there are some punctuations that can be kept or that are to be kept. And the other thing is that the uh, alignment has to be done before tokenization as it impacts pronunciation. To show an example here, you see that's when it's a, it's one word, um, it has a slightly different pronunciation than when it is two words, which is that is, and like you can see is. And so if you split the uh, tokens or split the word in order for syntactic parser to process it, you would end up getting the wrong phonetic analysis. And if you have, if your process is through the phonetic analysis and you don't know how to uh, integrate it with the tokenized syntax, you can, you know, uh, that can be pretty tricky. And a lot of time people write one off uh, pieces of code that handle these. But the idea here is to try to have a general architecture that uh, seamlessly integrates all these pieces. Then you do the syntactic parsing after removing tokens. Then you align the data and the two annotations, and then integrate the two layers. Once that is done, then you can do all kind of interesting analysis and test various hypotheses and generate statistics. But without that, you only have are dealing with one or the other part. Let's just take a quick look at how uh, each of the layers that are involved look like. So this is um, LipSmac and that's it, laugh. This is the uh, raw transcript. And on the right hand side, you see the same thing as a transcript um, listed in a vertical in a column. You'll see why in just a second. And there are some place, there are some rows that are empty, some rows that are wider than the others, and we'll see why. The next is uh, the tokenized sentence where you have space uh, added, you know, space between these uh, two tokens. That's uh, uh, an apostrophe S and the it and the period. And you see on the right hand side that the tokens have attributes. So there is a token index and there are one, two, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five tokens. And each token has a start and end character. And space also has a start and end character. Uh, and space is represented by uh, SP. And there are these uh, other things that we removed, like the uh, LS, which is for LipSmack, and LG, which is laugh, are shown grayed out. And you'll see why some of these things are grayed out in, in a little bit. This is what the forced alignment tool produces. Basically, it takes the um, uh, transcript, and this is a, the transcript that has slightly different um, uh, symbols because different tools use different symbols and there are various configurational things. But uh, this is what is used to get an alignment or time alignment with phones. So this column shows the phones. And so each word, so for example, and has been aligned with these phones. And these uh, on the start and end are essentially temporal uh, uh, or a time stamps that it aligns, that has been aligned to it. Interestingly, sometimes we don't really have any pause or any du time duration between some words. And those are uh, highlighted as gray here. See, there's this, this space is actually it does not have any uh, temporal content, whereas this other uh, space is has some duration. So the ones that have some duration are captured, while the others uh, are the ones that in the earlier diagram we saw were left out. And the align aligner actually produces multiple 
files, one of the files uh, it's got, uh, has the uh, a different, slightly different variation on the same information. And in this case, you can see that the uh, punctuation is missing, and the punctuation is, uh, you know, uh, deliberately uh, missing out because there is no time associated with it. And you see that it's uh, that uh, it's not un a tokenized sentence. A tokenized uh, word. This uh, now gives you a full table, and you can't really look into it very carefully. But uh, we can focus on the part that seems legible or you know properly written sentence, process it, and reincorporate it back into the whole. So if somebody wants to look at the exam, for example, how many pauses the person made while they were talking, they can actually measure the pause, the number, the duration, and make connections between that and the rich syntactic structure that is being produced. And in order to do that, you have to get these uh, layers to align with each other. And this table is just a tabular representation of the information that we'll be storing in the Yammer file. Congratulations, you have reached the end of this demonstration. Thank you for your time and attention.